She's chair of the UK Association of Nursing History. Uh, she's a professor of nursing at Huddersfield University. And we were so pleased. We were looking through and um, we were trying to get a keynote speaker and her name came up and we went, oh, we'll never get her. Well, let's ask, let's see what happens. And she, she agreed, which is wonderful. Um, she really is one of the country's leading authorities on nursing history. And she's published a whole bunch of highly regarded books. Um, her talk today is going to focus on Nellie Spindler and nursing. And I believe there'll be opportunity for questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, can you please welcome our guest, Professor Christine Howard. Thank you very much for that really kind invitation. I'll start with a few technical things. The first is, um, could you get that pic could we change that picture? Because it doesn't really look a lot like me at all. <laughs> the story behind that picture is that one of our neighbors actually took that picture for me and, uh, and then very kindly airbrushed it quite a lot. <laughs> Can we have Nellie Spindler back? Because this talk is about her. Yeah, yeah, that's great, thank you. Uh, the next little technical issue is, can you hear me fine at the back? Is the sound okay? Great, okay. Um, no, it's a real honor to be invited to speak here today. Um, and, and I just want to thank St. Andrews very much and everybody here very much for including me in your day. Um, oh, i just get my microphone as, as I like it. Um, and yeah, so. Today is mostly about Nellie Spindler. It's about remembrance. It's about remembering those millions of people who died during the First World War. Um, nurses in particular, we have a particular focus on nurses and a particular focus on this one nurse. But in talking about her and in talking about just telling her story, I think we're also here to remember nurses generally and the work of nurses, the work that nurses do now. Um, they're so important to us, and we don't always give them the credit that they deserve. So, starting with Nellie. On the 21st of August, 1917, staff nurse Nellie Spindler came off a night shift at an advanced abdominal center close to the village of Brandhook in Flanders. She handed over the care of her patients to the day staff and walked the short distance to her sleeping tent. The nurse who shared the tent with her had been sent down the line to the base hospital a day before, apparently suffering from both debility and shell shock. So Nellie settled down alone to sleep on her narrow stretcher bed. About 11 a.m., several bombs were dropped in the hospital compound. A piece of shell casing tore through the canvas wall of her tent wounding Nellie so severely that despite the best efforts of her medical and nursing colleagues, she could not be saved. She died in the arms of her matron, Minnie Wood, at about 11.20 a.m. on that day, the 21st of August, 1917. The Brandhook Advanced Abdominal Center was one of the most sophisticated field hospitals of the First World War's Western Front. It was also one of the most dangerous located just three miles from the front line at Ypres and consisting of three casualty clearing stations. Matrons Minnie Wood at number 44, Kate Luard at number 32, and Ida O'Dwyer at number three Australian. Yes, they had Australian nurses there as well. These three matrons all had difficult decisions to make. Nurses were in short supply only the most highly trained and reliable were posted to casualty clearing stations. And most could only remain for about six weeks before they began to suffer from exhaustion. The dangers posed by night bombing raids meant that matrons could only put a skeleton staff on night duty, making those shifts particularly onerous. In mid-August 1917, bombing raids became more intensive the proximity of the advanced medical units to the railheads at which troops, ammunition and supplies were being uploaded meant that shells frequently landed within hospital compounds. Following Nellie Spindler's death, the Brandhook Advanced Abdominal Centre was evacuated and all patients and staff 
were moved several miles west to St. Omer. But many more nurses were to die in similar circumstances whilst on active service before the armistice of November 1918. Nellie Spindler has become emblematic of the work and sacrifice of First World War nurses for many reasons. She was a fully trained professional whose work was vital to the rescue of wounded men on the Western Front. She was young, only 26, and she'd bravely volunteered to work close to the front lines in the zone of the armies where danger was acute. And her death was needless. Because of a shortage of wood for frontline trenches and duckboards, very few nurses in the so-called zone of the armies had wooden huts in which to sleep. Nellie's vulnerability, sleeping under canvas while shells landed all around her, somehow epitomizes the invisibility of professional nurses of her time. Not only does their intricate and highly responsible clinical work find almost no place in the written record, their needs, along with those of colleagues and patients, were also largely invisible to an army high command that has since been accused of being indifferent to the value of human life. So, we might ask, was Nellie Spindler's death and those of nurses like her simply a wasted sacrifice? In the 100 years since the end of the First World War, we've become accustomed to its association with needless loss of life. But an understanding of the work of professional nurses can enable us to tell a different story. Nurses were not taking, but saving lives, and many died themselves as a result of that life-saving work. These nurses are now remembered, alongside those who died during the Second World War, on a new nurses' memorial at the National Arboretum in Staffordshire. But their participation in the two world wars should not be seen merely in terms of self-sacrifice. They saw their clinical practice close to the front lines as an act of responsible risk-taking. The recognition in the autumn of 1914 that both wound shock and anaerobic bacterial infections were taking many lives meant that senior medical officers of the Royal Army Medical Corps decided to place casualty clearing stations close to the battlefields where the men were being wounded to enable surgery to take place within just a few hours. But such surgery was impossible without the participation of fully trained expert nurses who resuscitated and hydrated patients who would otherwise have died before even reaching an operating theatre. These nurses prepared the patients for surgery, gave them vital assistance during operations, and supported patients' recovery from the toxic anaesthetics, ether and chloroform. Wartime advances in wound treatment were rapid and intensive and, e and extensive as well, and nurses played vital roles in these advances. Not to take anything away from the doctors, who were doing amazing work as well, but it's the nurses who tend to be invisible in these processes. Alongside their expert surgical interventions, professional nurses also, with the support of military orderlies, provided the fundamental nursing care which preserved lives and enabled bodies to be rebuilt. And they provided significant and life-saving emotional care to their patients. In spite, of a lack, in spite of a lack of direct training for such mental health work. The centenary of the First World War has been marked by a number of efforts to remember the important contribution that was made by these highly trained, courageous and altruistic women. Yet somehow the failure of their own contemporaries to recognize the full scope and impact of their practice is mirrored in a lack of attention to nurses' work today. Not here, of course, but in the world generally. It's very difficult to clearly demonstrate the link that exists between nurses' expert clinical work and patient survival and recovery. Today's historians and school curriculum writers are still failing to recognize the pivotal importance of nursing work, as illustrated by the fact that volunteer ambulance workers are mentioned in the GCSE curriculum, whilst professional military nurses are not. And all credit to the volunteer ambulance workers, but there were a lot more nurses and they were doing, I think, even more important work. 
But perhaps some progress has been made. Within the nursing profession itself, much has been achieved. Books and articles have been written, living history projects fronted by today's professional nurses have achieved a high profile at national commemorative events. Exhibitions have been held. In their own time, nurses made the point that women could work close to the front lines on active war service, helping to win by their example, not only votes for women through the extension of the franchise in 1918, but also a legally sanctioned register for their profession on the 23rd of December 1919. By recognizing and highlighting the significance of nurses' achievements, we can make visible the previously hidden nature of their work, revealing the legacy of a profession that is continuing to perform essential and life-saving work today. So that's, kind of, that's the end of my talk, but before I really end, I just want to take us back to Nellie Spindler, the focus of uh, everything that I've been saying. Um, she is emblematic, really, of all that work. The work she was doing as a staff nurse uh, for very little remuneration, very, very little remuneration. It was really a voluntary effort, pretty much, by these nurses. The work she was doing was highly technical. She'd had three years training and a lot of experience before she was allowed to do this kind of work. And she knew how dangerous it was to be at Brandhook, three miles from the front lines. So uh, it's just really important that we are remembering her today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't know if there's time for questions. We can probably have just one or two. Has anyone got any questions they'd like to ask Christine? Did any yes. nurses uh, get VCs? Uh, no, nurses weren't allowed to be given the Victoria Cross. Uh, they couldn't be awarded the VC because they were not officers. Um, a lot of nurses got the military medal. Um, which was a, a medal that could be given to non-commissioned officers or to privates, and nurses could get that medal as well. Just to mention, I'm glad you asked about medals, because one of our own Wakefield nurses, um, Minnie Wood, the matron I mentioned, Nellie Spindler died in the arms of her matron, Minnie Wood, and Minnie Wood did amazing work keeping casualty clearing station number 44 running, and then evacuating all the staff and patients after the bombing. And she was a Wakefield nurse, she grew up in Sandal, um, and she was awarded the military medal for the work she did at Brandhook. But Nellie Spindler didn't get a medal. Were well, they officers, uh, these nurses? I mean, today they are, aren't they? They are officers today, yes. They've got, in the Army, in the Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps, they've got officer status. But they didn't have that. They didn't get that until 1943. Do we have one question from that side, Pastor? Anne? Yeah, actually at the moment I'm working on nurse registration and Ethel Gordon Fenwick, the um, great campaigner for registration for nurses. So hopefully, sooner or later, it might be a while, but there'll, there'll be a book on that. And I'm also continuing to work on remembrance, commemoration, because I've found these last four years just so interesting, the way in which um, the nation has chosen, but smaller community groups have chosen. Um, at all levels, we've chosen to commemorate those who died during the First World War. And um, I think some of our efforts have been better than others. And the extent to which we've really remembered these people, you know, um, I think it's worth looking into in a bit more detail. So I'm working on that now as well. Talking of remembering, just very quickly, I just want to mention that there are quite a number of people here today from Nellie Spindler's family. Um, and I want to mention in particular Margaret and Laurie, um, niece and nephew of Nellie Spindler, um, children of uh, Nellie's brother, um, George Edward. Have I got that right? Yeah. Okay, so it's great to have them here as well, really, remembering on a very personal level. Thank I'll you. Stop. Thank you, Christine. Okay.